I'm Megan Carney. Uh, I just like to start off by saying thank you to Sean for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, and thank you to everyone who's shown up on Zoom because it's Friday afternoon and I'm sure it's not easy to uh, sit through another talk. <laughs> Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about non-stationary extremal modeling and weather systems. Uh, and when we talk about modeling extremes or rare events in a system, uh, we're often interested in looking at the probabilities or return times of these extremes, uh, especially in settings like uh, weather systems where things are complex and chaotic. So this is, um, it's natural to look at this setting uh, from a probabilistic point of view. And that's why we introduce some random variable stuff. So given a sequence of random variables x1 through xn, we define the maxima of our system as the max from x1 to xn. Then we have the following definition of an extreme value law, which I've taken from Lucarini et al. This is a book on extremes and recurrence in 2016, but it can be dated at least all the way back to Ledbetter in 1973. If we let un be a sequence of constants defined by some normalization requirement, and x1 through xn are independent and identically distributed, or IID random variables, then the limit of the measure of these maxima less than or equal to un is equal to e to the negative theta tau, where theta is between 0 and 1. It's called the extremal index, and 1 over theta roughly measures the clustering of exceedances of these maxima. So in classical theory, the sequences of real numbers un are usually taken to be one parameter linear families that look like un is y over a n plus b n. And in this setting, uh, we have a theorem by Nadenko in 1943, although there's some previous work that led up to this result from Fisher and Tibet in 1928. And that's given that we have x1 through x on iid. There exists normalizing sequences a n and b n with a n positive such that the probability of the normalized maxima converge to one of three types of distribution. And we'll talk about what those three types are. But first I have to tell you that all three types can be put together into a one distribution, three parameter function called the generalized extreme value distribution. The three parameters in this case are the location parameter mu, the scale parameter sigma, and the shape parameter k although uh, K is arguably the most important because it tells us um, the behavior of the tails of this distribution. Okay, so when K is equal to zero, we have what we call a type one distribution or a Gumbel distribution, and this creates exponential tails. Uh, when K is positive, we have something called a type two or a Frechet distribution, which gives polynomial tails or fat tails. And if k is negative, we have a bounded tail, which we call the Weibel type distribution or a type three. And these are just the um, probability uh, density functions corresponding to those three g's that we saw before. When we talk about time series um, or dynamics, it's really hard to say that something is independent because most of the time it's not. So it's natural to ask, can we, can we uh, relax this requirement for independence and replace it with something else? And uh, Ledbetter actually in 1979 showed that if X1 through Xn is stationary and these two dependence conditions hold, we can still get an extreme value law for our system. The first, uh, this is a lot of uh, text, just uh, to be very clear, but um, the first condition is just like a mixing condition, something like decay of correlations. And the second is a recurrence condition, which bounds the probabilities of returns of these maxima. So as I was saying before, um, I would hate to talk about something um, to a dynamics group without actually talking about the dynamics part of all of this. Uh, but in order to talk about um, extremes in a, in a dynamical sense, we need to look at the dyna dynamical system as a stochastic process. Uh, so here we look at our map T on a space X with a measure mu, and we define the stochastic process as the observable taken on iterations of our map. 
Our observable represents some physical quantity that can be measured and holds some regularity. We'll talk about what the observable looks like in a little bit. And when we're interested in modeling deterministic physical phenomena, uh, T is usually taken as ergodic and measure preserving and mu a probability measure. So we're in a nice probability space to establish a distributional and light convergence um, for maxima and the like. In classical uh, theory, we often take the observable to be some function of the distance between X and a fixed point P in a space, where our choice of our function determines one of those three types of distributions we saw before. For the following example that I'll show you in dynamics, uh, we're going to take our observable to be negative log of the distance between X and the fixed point P. So that P is actually the unique maximal point, and there's some relationship between obtaining extreme values in our system and visiting shrinking neighborhoods about P. In fact, P determines our extremal index and the extreme value law. And in this setting, uh, we think of our extremal index as the measure of points that stay in the neighborhood divided by the measure of point, total points that start in the neighborhood. But before I talk about our result, I'd like to talk a little bit about some literature that led up to it. Uh, so remember that when we're trying to prove an extreme value law, we have to show that X1 through Xn are stationary and that D and D prime hold for our system. But when we are assuming uh, the measure to be invariant, we are automatically have stationarity in our sequence. So all we really have to do is show that D and D prime hold. In 2012, Nicole Hall and Dirac showed that an extreme value law exists for non-uniformly expanding maps under D and D prime. Then Ferguson and Pollicott in 2012 showed that for certain one-dimensional uniformly expanding maps, the extremal index is equal to one if P is not periodic and less than one otherwise. In 2010, Freitas, Freitas, and Todd showed some dynamical variants of D and D prime, which we will use today. And then in 2014, Hayden, Freitas, and Nichols showed that an extreme value law exists for the Sinaitis versing billiard model with a non-periodic point P, and the extremal index is one in this case. And then I worked with Matt Nickel and Hong Kun Zhang in 2017 on the Sinai dispersing billiard model with a Q periodic point. And we show that the extremal index is less than one. In fact, it's some function of the, uh, the expansion and the unstable direction and the Q periodicity of the point. That's what this is right here. But before I show you how we prove an extreme value law in the setting, I'd like to show you what the model actually looks like. So this is a hand-drawn, unfortunately, uh, example of the Sinai dispersing billiard model with finite time horizon. And this is just particles that bounce around in a space and collide with circular barriers. For those of you who are interested in looking at billiards and all of the dynamical information involved, Chernoff and Markarian wrote an excellent book in this in 2006. So as I mentioned, we do have to prove that D and D prime hold for our system, but D is just really a standard decay of correlations argument. And the novelty of most of these papers lies in the proof of D prime, the recurrence condition. So what we're trying to do in our setup is show that the points that leave the small neighborhood of P don't return too often because we reach all of our maximum values inside that small neighborhood, what we call omega. So here's just an example of what this looks like. If we have our point P and we take a small neighborhood about P, we can use the hyperbolic properties of our map to show that points leave and stay gone for a certain number of iterates. And then the once they are able to return, they don't return too often. So we're going to assume that um, we have our unstable and stable directions. We have uh, an eigenvalue that represents the, uh, the amount that we, the factor by which we expand along the unstable direction. And then we also have one for the stable direction, but we're interested in, in points that leave our neighborhood. So if we 
expand out along the unstable direction by a factor of lambda, we know that we can't return for C log n iterates because on the torus, we won't reach the edge for C log n. Now, once we are able to reach the edge, we have the opportunity to actually run into a singularity for the space. And if we run into a singularity, we end up with fragmentation of the phase space, which is just many tiny pieces that may land back inside our, our uh, neighborhood. And what we want to make sure is that those tiny pieces don't stay there for very long. There's actually a growth lemma for the Sinai dispersing billiard model that says that those tiny pieces will expand out in one iteration, so they don't stay for too long. And we use that for any iterate up to log n to the one plus delta. And then we complete this by noting that we have exponential decay of correlations for um, or using D, our decay of correlations argument for anything greater or any iterate greater than log n to the one plus delta. And yeah, this is a sketch and it doesn't have all of the details in it, but that's basically what, what it looks like. Um, we have some points we want to expand away from the point. We use hyperbolic properties of the map to bound how many times we can return. And then we can show that D prime holds. But that's in a really idealistic setting where we have an invariant measure. So we have stationarity. And we know exactly what we need to prove in order to show that an extreme value law exists. But in the real world, things don't really work like that. In fact, we don't really know the underlying system because it's extremely complex. So in weather data, especially, XN often take the form of a time series of measurements like temperature, precipitation, pressure. So at least we have a sequence of random variables, measures, measurements of something that's interesting or observable even if we don't know the underlying system. And now it's natural to ask, how do we use D and D prime or how do those translate to this system of time series? Well, this comes back to the core argument of D and D prime, which is a blocking argument for stationary stochastic processes. This is actually based on uh, the blocking argument um, by Markov for, central, for the central limit theorem stationary stochastic processes. I think it was written in 1906, um, but the original one was written in Russian. So it was hard to find an exact year on that. But Ledbetter uses this and adapts it for um, maxima for stationary stochastic processes. And the blocking, blocking argument basically says that D allows for decorrelation between blocks and D prime allows for decorrelation within blocks. So then it's natural to look at this time series in terms of blocks. And, and Gumbel did this in 1958. Um, he introduced something called the block maximum method, which partitions this very long time series into n blocks of length i, say, and then takes a maximum over each block. And as long as the block is long enough, we get this decay of correlation that we need. And M1 through M1i through MMI can be modeled by an extreme value distribution provided the underlying Xn are stationary. So one main question that uh, a lot of people have is what's the relationship between obtaining these block maxima and the block length? Because if you can just reach the asymptotic regime for the GEV in one block length, what does it mean for the other one, a longer one, say? And this is our relationship. So if we have a very long block, we know that the probability of these maxima is approximately GEV with our sequence of constants being an AN. If we break this block up, provided I is long enough, to reach the asymptotic GEV. The probability of these is the multiplication of all of these GEVs because we have independence with um, normalizing constants BI and AI. In fact, BI and AI converge to some, uh, will converge, BI converges to the location parameter and AI converges to one over the, um, the scale parameter. So G and G to the M, or the distribution of maxima for this long block 
and the distribution and maximum for the small blocks are identical apart from their location and scale parameters. Uh, this means something um, really important, which is that G and GM have the same shape parameter. They're in the same type of distribution. And here's the official statement of that theorem. And that is a distribution is max stable. That is, this is true. If and only if it's a generalized extreme value distribution. So there's our relationship between block sizes. Okay, so now that we've established that we can use the block maximum method to uh, model extremes of a time series, We'd like to look at one example where we have actually modeled extremes. Um, so this is based on some work I did with Robert Azencott and Matt Nichol. Uh, it was published in 2020 in the International Journal of Climatology. Um, well, here we looked at time series of um, temperature values, hourly recordings of these. And we defined a single maximum to be the maximum over a 10 day block of temperature hourly recordings. So that's 240 values. Our preliminary work was to look at just the time series for Houston and see if we could somehow get a GEV model for those summer temperatures. So we, pre we performed maximum likelihood estimation on the um, negative log likelihood of the GEV with shape parameter location and scale. And what we find is, a, unfortunately, a very poor fit for the data. So our next question was whether or not the data is somehow not um, living up to the assumptions that we require, which is that stationarity or that independ rough independence across blocks. So we checked the independence um, and, and find that that's okay. So our next idea was maybe we have some non-stationarity in the data. So we break up our time scale into blocks of 1941 to 1981, and then 1981 to 2017. And we fit the GEV to the first half and find that we actually get a pretty good fit of the data. In fact, the Anderson-Darling test, which tests whether or not the data fits in the tails, um, says that we do have a good fit. But when we look at the data from 1981 to 2017, we find that poor fit again, especially in the tails. So we did some change point analysis and um, we found that there is a change in the location and scale parameters. And uh, we look at a, the Mann-Kendall test, which is a non-parametric test um, for trend. And what we find is that over the time period 1981 to 2017, in both cases, we see something like a trend. It depends on your alpha value, but something like a trend in, in these two parameters, especially in the scale. Well, that's all well and good. It tells us something about what's happening in Houston, but it doesn't tell us a lot on the regional scale or the state scale or the global scale. So we can't really make a good decision on whether something's actually happening in real life or whether it's just an anomaly in one station. Uh, so we really need comprehensive information on extreme weather events to make reasonable conclusions about our data. And a natural way of doing this is looking at clustering because the general goal of clustering is to group things by similarity. And this allows us to look at, say, regions with similar weather. That was our idea. And these methods are actually not commonly known in extreme value literature. And the tricky part is really translating a system where we have, say, a bunch of stations with time series in a quantitative and relevant way to uh, a clustering algorithm. Well, the basic clustering algorithm for points in Rn looks like this. We start with k random centroids. We assign points in the space to the closest centroid. We recalculate the centroid based on some distance. 
reassign points, recalculate centroids, and end when we've hit some minimized sum of intercluster distances. So that's the, the concept here. And that's a lot of words. So I actually made a little um, video of what something like K means looks like. Here we have three starting centroids and uh, points are reassigned to a centroid in each iteration. The centroid is recalculated, so it changes. And once we reach that minimum distance, the centroids don't change anymore. So our goal then is to use clustering methods to answer the question, what does it mean to be a weather region in a mathematical sense? And we consider the set of geographic weather stations where each station has its own time series of weather recordings. In the case of Texas, we have a bunch of stations over Texas that each have some temperature time series. And we define the measure of similarity between two stations, we'll call them I and J, based on their time series, XI and XJ. For example, we can say the similarity between I and J is the correlation, or we can say that it's the mutual information between two time series. The mutual information uh, is more, um, is, is better in our case, because it compares the probability distributions essentially of two time series. So that's what we use. So now that we've this giant matrix of similarities, we have that each station SI in RN is represented by a point that where each uh, coordinate inside that point is just its similarity with every other station inside the network. Now we can run a clustering algorithm on these points inside the space. Something like k-means, but k-means requires some linear separability. It means that we can only separate these points inside the space by some hyperplane. But sometimes these points aren't easily separable. So this is where spectral clustering methods come into play. And although I'm not gonna talk about spectral clustering today, because it'll take just way too long, um, Von Luxburg in 2007 wrote a really great paper on the foundations of spectral clustering. And Hasty, Tipshrani, and Friedman wrote uh, an awesome uh, book on the methods of statistical learning and some introduction into pretty much every statistical learning co um, concept that you can think of right now. So once we've defined our uh, network to be this set of similarities, where uh, each station is similar to another station by comparing their time series and we run our spectral clustering algorithm, we find four different clusters across Texas. The first is along the coast, the second is the south, the third is in the north, and the fourth along the central band. Now we ask ourselves, once we pull all of the data from those clusters and fit a GEV, which we call the regional GEV, is that a good fit? Or are we seeing some non-stationarity across the region? So we check whether it's a good fit for 1941 to 2017. And I know this is quite small, but this is as big as I could make it on the slide. Um, so we fit it across 1941 to 2017, and we find that the p-values are really around zero for the Anderson Darling fit, which means that they're not a good fit for the data in all cases, every cluster. But if we break them up again, like we did with Houston and look at 1941 to 1981 and the 1981 to 2017, we find in the first case, 41 to 81, that we get reasonably good fits for the GEV. In 1981 to 2017, in all cases, we get bad fits for the GEV. So based on our preliminary results, we start investigating some non-stationarity in, in the data. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, Louisiana is a, a part of it. <laughs> yeah, and this was because um, we saw so many uh, hurricanes that hit over in Houston also hit Louisiana in New Orleans. So yeah, they, they were clustered around there. Good catch. <laughs> um, 
right? Okay, so once we've investigated this non stationarity in our regional, um, our regional GEV, what we found by doing these non parametric Mann Kendall tests and a parametric regression test that the location parameter changes quadratically over time and the scale is actually changing linearly over time in each of the cases. So our goal now is to minimize the negative log likelihood of the generalized extreme value distribution. But instead of this location and scale parameter being stationary, they're now functions of t. And we, we minimize by beta naught, beta one, beta two, alpha naught, and alpha one. And yes, this is, seems like a really complicated uh, model. And I know the next question is, did you check some more simple models? Uh, did you look at the um, log ratio test? And the answer is yes, we did. <laughs> So, and, and this was a, a good representation. Uh, so then we, we ran again our Anderson Darling Goodness of Fit test for the stationary case, that's before non stationary, and then the after, where we did a non stationary fit for both location and scale parameters. And this is what we were really interested in the fits from 1941 to, 19, or to 2017, making sure that we get a non-stationary GEV that represents the entire uh, timeline of data. So uh, what this says is that for cluster one, we don't have a good fit, and then we do have a good fit. In fact, this is true for one, three, and four. And then two, even though we don't have a great fit uh, in the after we do non-stationary fitting, um, we do have something that is tenfold better. Okay, so uh, now we know we have a non-stationary GEV, and we know that the mean and scale are changing in some way. But what we really want to do is look at what is the probability? Like, how is that changing in our non-stationary system? Uh, so we look at the non-stationary model for 1941, and 2017 and compare them, because that's what we're ultimately interested in. How are the probabilities changing? And in each case, we see that the probability of being above, and this is of course in Fahrenheit, <laughs> because this is US-based, um, the probability of being above 100, 105, and, 110, and 110 are all greater for each cluster. And I actually wrote this out on a table because it's much easier to read than looking at these very small images. Uh, I wrote out the ratio of the probability of seeing a temperature above 100, 105, and 107 for each of the clusters. And what we see is this um, probability of seeing something above 107 three times more likely for cluster one, 4.8 more likely than cl for cluster two, and then one and a half times more likely for three and four. And this is just a location and scale comparison from 1941 to 2017 for these non-stationary non models where you see an increase. Okay, so um, we decided when I was looking at some stuff at Max Planck that we were going to do something very similar to, um, to data across Germany. Only the Deutsche Witterdien service, and I hope that I said that appropriately, um, they have so much more data than Texas, which is really excellent. But it also introduced some uh, new technical difficulties in, in defining what a weather region is, because they just have so many stations, and it, it creates this really complex and dense network. So in this case, we had to introduce something called kernel k-means, which separates the network, not by hyperplanes, but actually by functions in the space. And then we introduced some um, new method that compresses the data along eigenvalues. So we keep more information, or we keep uh, coordinates that have the most information and rule out coordinates that have the least information. But I think what was most interesting to me when I was looking uh, through this data was the clustering result for two different networks 
defined by different um, weather recordings. In one, I looked at the similarity uh, between a time series from stations for hourly temperature, like I did in, in Texas. And the other, I looked at daily precipitation average and defined similarity using that time series. And what I found was actually the clustering um, of the stations is roughly the same with one or two different. So what this told me was that there's, there's something solid about using a clustering algorithm to define uh, a weather region because two different time series for different, different uh, weather measurements give roughly the same uh, cluster out. And once again, we tried to do some um, stationary GEV modeling on the temperature uh, in Germany. And we found that um, there's some linear trend in the, in the mean of the temperature and poor fits for the stationary. Uh, in fact, uh, this just shows you the um, temperature mean from 1960 to 1990 down here and 1991 to 2018. And it just shows that there's some obvious statistical uh, difference between those two and that this one is much higher. And once we incorporated this non-stationarity into our models, um, we wanted to look once again at the probabilities of seeing some temperature, so, some seven day maximum temperature above 35 degrees Celsius. And this is in Celsius because we're in Germany. Uh, and what we find is that we get about um, between five and six times more likely of seeing a, a maximum seven day temperature greater than 35 degrees Celsius in all of the regions, but the least in the Northwest. And our idea is that this is the case because it's closer to the North Sea. So there's a little bit more regulation there. And that concludes my talk. Thank you.